chapter 17, Persuasive Strategies. You have made it. You are here. Wow. We're nearing the end of the semester. You're coming to your last speech that you will be giving. It's all going to be about persuasiveness, persuading us to change our way of thinking, persuading us to start doing something, persuading us to stop doing something. Hopefully by now you have a good idea about what you're going to be talking about. So what we're going to do today is look at some of these strategies that you can implement into your speech this time around that's going to help you persuade us. And I hope that you are working very hard on it and diligently because this is where all the rubber meets the road. This is the biggest portion of your grade, 20% on this one speech. So I hope that you are doing well. When you go to persuade an audience, you have to know your audience. You have to know them inside and out. You must put yourself in their shoes. You have to stand in their shoes and see the world from their viewpoint. So let's take a look at one case that illustrates the importance of knowing your audience. If you are going to give a speech persuading people to stop tailgating and the dangerous, if you've ever been tailgated, it's very unnerving as a driver. Uh, Some law enforcement... Officers give these speeches aimed at persuading the public to stop driving too close behind other cars on the highway. Now, studies have shown there are a couple of ways of educating the public about this issue. And one way is actually much superior than the other. The option A in persuading your audience is to give a bunch of tips on how to keep a safe driving distance between cars. And option B is that you give listeners statistics and then tips. For instance, you would give them tips, uh, statistics, excuse me, uh, about telling them of that rear-end collisions caused the deaths of 11,000 Americans every year. And and most rear-end collisions are caused by tailgating. And research indicates that option B here is more effective in changing people's behavior. And you may be asking yourself, why? Uh, It's because most people are unaware of just how dangerous tailgating can be. Once you throw those statistics in there, they get a broader and general sense of how dangerous that practice is. And then you go into the tips and they will be persuaded more likely to change their habits when it comes to driving. So giving tips is great, but when you put statistics and alarming statistics pairing with them, you have more persuasion that goes on. And you need to know your audience. You need to find out who they are and where they stand on your subject. You need to interview as many of them as you can or a few of them in advance. Have them fill out a questionnaire and analyze the results you get back. Maybe just do some personal interviews. Hey, what do you know about this subject? You need to know these things. Because once you analyze your audience, you're going to find they fall into six different categories. The first category is... Your audience may be totally unaware of the issue that you want to speak about. They could be aware of that issue, but they may be totally against what you have to say. The third category would be that they're aware of the issue, but they really just don't care. They're apathetic about what you are choosing to speak on. Uh, They may be informed and they may be interested, but they could be just totally neutral on their view. They don't go either way. Uh, Maybe they are already convinced of your viewpoint and you need to model uh, your organizational pattern after uh, maybe a statement of, reason, statement of reasons that will help uh, continue that uh, persuasion to keep them on that same viewpoint. And maybe they are already at level six, which is where they are ready to take action. Your audience is going to fall somewhere on one of these six different categories. Now, one of the biggest persuasive sources that you can have in your speech is to build credibility. We've talked about this all semester. You have to build some credibility into your presentation because before listeners will accept your ideas, they want to know whether you're reliable. They want to know if you are competent. They want to know that they can trust you and what you have to say. So if you build credibility, you are more likely to persuade them. Now, some speakers have credibility just because of their their occupation or their level of experience. For example, uh, if you were uh, listening to a speech from a judge and he's talking about things that happen in a courtroom, that would be automatic credibility. They are there. They are the ones who preside over courtrooms. So, yes, 
uh, their speech would be very credible because of the topic that they are speaking on. Think about a chemistry professor. They can be trusted to give accurate information about that subject because they've studied uh, chemistry and science for many, many years. Uh, let's say that uh, this college student who's from Kenya is giving a, a speech about wildlife in her native country. I would consider her very credible. I am not from Kenya. So she has been there. She has experienced the wildlife. We can say that she's trustworthy when she talks about the animals of her hometown in her home country. Now, you can also borrow credibility because the truth is you can't be an expert on everything in the world. But you can borrow credibility by getting information from other experts, such as this scientist. The viewpoints of experts can be gained from books and articles and research and emails to them and personal interviews. So make sure if you are not that expert in that field to go seek someone out who is and bring that information, borrow their credibility and bring it into your presentations. Now, when you make an assertion in a speech, a contention, even when you make a point, it's not enough just to say, trust me on this, or hey guys, I know I'm right on this. The audience demands evidence. They demand proof in a speech. Evidence is presented in the form of supporting materials, such as examples, statistics, and testimonies for experts. You've heard me say this throughout the entire semester. You have to provide evidence. Get your table some legs. Get that table off of the ground. Think about this. In a trial, the jury is not just going to believe the prosecutor's evidence unless it is reliable and proves their point. That's when it becomes believable. In a speech, an audience is not going to believe a speaker's evidence unless it's accurate and up-to-date as well. For example, a student who argues that high-speed trains are superior to cars for interstate travel has to show that his statistics and testimony from experts are reliable and current. They have to be up-to-date. You don't want to go too far back in your research you want to have the most up-to-date uh, evidence that you can bring to the table. Now, here's a warning, warning, warning. For this final speech, your persuasive speech, you are required to develop your credibility by either personal experience or statistical data. You must, and you have to cite this material in your speech. Feel the weight of me putting this on your shoulder. You are required to develop your credibility. You must cite it and tell me where you got it from. Who did you speak to? What article did this come from? I want to hear it. So there's your warning. <laughs> Deduction is actually a type of reasoning that starts with a generalization, and it moves through a specific instance and ends with a conclusion. Now, just to back up a little bit, reasoning is the act of reaching conclusions on the base of someone's logical thinking. It's just a part of everyday life, right? If, if you take an umbrella with you on a walk because you look up at the clouds and you notice that they're massing in this black and it's probably going to rain, you are using reasoning to pre prevent yourself from getting soaked on this walk. Um, and that's true that that people are not always logical and rational, but it's also true that they have frequently can be persuaded by a message that appeals to their power of reasoning. And so we're going to take a look at a few different types of reasoning. And the first one is actually deduction. It's a type of, of reasoning that starts with a generalization, then moves through a specific instance and ends with that conclusion that we just talked about. Uh, to take an example, let's start with this generalization, that space exploration is desirable. Now, a specific instance is this. A space station is an important part of exploration in space, and so one may deduce or conclude a space station is desirable. So this is the deduction method. On the flip side, there's a thing called induction. It's a type of reasoning that starts with a specific instance or evidence, and then it moves to a generalized conclusion. For example, if a physician suddenly and unexpectedly sees dozens of patients who have a skin rash, then they can conclude that the community is suffering from an outbreak of an infectious disease. Induction is the method often used by scientists. Uh, they make a lot of observations and they draw conclusions from what they have observed. So there's a couple of types of, of ways of looking at it. 
Now, we want to go into a section here called fallacies and reasoning. We're going to go over several different types. And, and the reason I want to tell you about fallacies and, and reasoning is because a fallacy is really an error that renders an argument or an idea or a persuasive point false or unreliable. And you want to avoid them at all costs in your own speeches. And as a listener, we need to be trained to be listening for these things in arguments that other people make so we can recognize them and toss them away from our mind. So let's take a look at several different uh, fallacies and reasoning, and you'll see and maybe even recognize some of these as we go through. The bandwagon fallacy goes like this. Everybody's buying lottery tickets, so jump on the bandwagon and buy your lottery ticket today. Now, it's a fallacy to assume that if something is popular, then it must be wise and good. So you want to avoid bandwagoning in your speeches. Another type of fallacy in reasoning is a thing called a hasty generalization. Now, a hasty generalization is simply a conclusion that's been reached on the basis of insufficient evidence. For example, a person says, I knew a redheaded kid in the third grade who was always getting into fights on the playground, and I knew two redheads who were easily angered, so I guess you could say that redheads are quick-tempered people. Then the generalization is based on inadequate evidence here. It's too broad and, and too sweeping to be fair, so stay away from them or recognize them when you hear them in audiences excuse me, as an audience in a speech. Uh, another type of fallacy in reasoning is a thing called red herring. A, a red herring argument is, is classic. It distracts listeners from the real issue at hand. It leads them toward an irrelevant matter to kind of get their attention off of the real issue. It's, it's, this trick is used tons in uh, political debates. You have seen that through the presidential debates last year. Uh, for example, uh, one may argue for laws that protect the bald eagle, and then an opponent counters, how can we even think about birds when our most pressing problems deal with humans? Let's work on taking care of homeless people before we get all hot and bothered about animals. A red herring has been presented. So uh, make sure that you can distinguish between the real issues and the irrelevant matters that are brought up to divert people's attention. Uh, another type of fallacy in reasoning is what we call an ad hominem. This is simply an attack on a person. Um, this is when an opponent tries to discredit a person's argument by not discussing the merits of the argument, but by attacking the person who's actually giving the argument. For example, how can you believe anything this old guy is saying? Just look at him. He wears old clothes. He's grubby looking, and he probably hasn't taken a bath in a month when the real argument here is about raising minimum wage. So the fallacy and reasoning here, ad hominem, let's attack the person, not the real argument. Let's get people's attention off of that. We're going to discredit his credibility. That is a fallacy and reasoning. And you know what? It's just not nice. So stay away from it. The fallacy of false cause is something that occurs when you assume that because events occur close together in time that they're, they're related for some reason as basically a cause and effect. For example, a person may say, so far this season, our soccer team has lost every time our players wore blue socks. When they wore white socks, they won. Therefore, to win the rest of the games, our players should never wear blue socks again. The problem is, there's absolutely no proof that wearing blue socks caused the losses. So you have to be careful about this fallacy. Another fallacy in reasoning is building on an unproven assumption. Uh, this means that you're taking an opinion and acting as if it's an established uh, fact that everyone agrees on. Imagine a person who says, since a dog is the best pet for a child, we should make sure that every child in our society has a dog. Now, as a cat lover, you may say, wait a minute, who says dogs are the best? When speakers are using this type of fallacy, many listeners rightfully feel as if they're being tricked into giving assent to a proposition that they absolutely do not believe in. Another type of fallacy is a false analogy. Uh, when people use false analogies, they make the mistake of assuming that because two things are alike in little bitty ways, that they're also alike in huge ways. Suppose a person says, if we can put an astronaut on the moon, why can't I, why can't we find a cure for the common cold? Well, the two issues are alike in a few respects, right? Uh, for example, both involve science and both involve research, but 
Going to the moon is a matter of technology, while finding a cure for the common cold involves a hugely complex biological process that this professor doesn't understand. Just because the moon was visited many years ago doesn't mean that finding a cure for the common cold should be easy. So be careful about your false analogies. Uh, a couple more as we go through these fallacies and reasoning. Well, this one is the either-or reasoning. Uh, this occurs when a speaker offers only two alternatives, and when in fact there are a ton of alternatives. Suppose a person says, we must adopt a vegetarian diet or we will all die of cancer. Are these really the only two choices we have? No, they're not. So be careful of either or reasoning. And the last one we're going to end up on is a fallacy called a straw man. This is the easiest one to defeat in arguments because in, in some arguments, people ignore their opponent's true position and they substitute an exaggerated version or a straw man, if you will, which is really easy to defeat. Uh, for example, a politician attacks his opponent for advocating a ban on smoking. So in retaliation, he says, my opponent wants to control every aspect of your life. He wants to tell you what you can eat. He wants to tell you what you can drink and what you can and cannot eat and drink. Well, he set up a straw man because the opponent was only talking about smoking, not all of these other things. The politician creates this unfair, exaggerated image of his opponent, a straw man, and that straw man can be easily defeated. Now, another persuasive strategy as we kind of take this chapter, uh, start bringing it in for a landing, is you can appeal to emotions. Uh, motivations are the needs, excuse me, you can appeal to motivations. Motivations are the needs, desires, or drives that impel a person toward a goal or away from some kind of a negative situation. People have hundreds of motivations, including Think about it, love, happiness, health, social acceptance, financial security, who doesn't want that, adventure even, so on and so forth. If you show your listeners how your ideas can help them satisfy these needs and desires, you increase your chances of persuading them to adopt your point of view. Now, a popular model for motivations and appealing to motivations is simply something you are probably all familiar with, and that's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um the basic level is the uh, physiological level. That's water, food, sleep, clothing, medicine, so on and so forth. You, you know about this. Uh, the second level is safety. And we're looking for things like shelter, safety from violence. These are just the basic rudimentary uh, needs that we have as humans. The next level is love and belonging, such as friendship, family. And then it goes on to the esteem needs, such as recognition, success. And then the higher level is self-actualization, where we can realize our full potentials as humans. And ideally, our journey through life takes us on an upward climb. But in reality here, we sometimes find that our needs are unmet at various levels. For instance, you may be in the same esteem and self-actualization phase, but the love and belonging, you may begin to suffer from some sort of anxiety or a real-world situation where belonging has been thwarted. You have to take these into consideration when you are persuading. Can you show your audience how your point actually fulfills one of these needs? And you can also arouse emotions. And emotions are stirred up feelings that we get, and we can stimulate our listeners and rouse them to action by being very ethical, but doing it in the correct way. Uh, in some situations, it's very ethical to arouse negative emotions or anger and sadness. Now, you don't want to do this all the time, but sometimes it is totally worth it because these are the emotions that are engendered in a campaign to persuade people to never shake a baby. Think about it. That is something worthy of getting angry about. That is something worthy of bringing up a sad point to illustrate the dangers of shaking a baby because you're looking for that positive outcome that people are now persuaded never to shake their children. Don't forget, though, you can also arouse a positive emotion such as joy and delight, too. So don't forget that. It goes both ways. Um, but here's the deal. If you're going to use an emotional appeal, you should always combine it with a rational appeal all at the same time. For instance, uh, this medical doctor here is speaking emotionally about her patients who have suffered great pain because of air pollution. 
But at the same time, she gives scientific evidence about what causes air pollution and what Americans can actually do to help clean up the air. So even though it's emotional, we have very good rational appeals at the very end of it. So by and large, in chapter 17, you have tons of different uh, arrows to put into your quiver that you can actually use to persuade your audience. Just remember, we keep a high ethical standard. There's that fine line between persuasion and manipulation. Make sure that you are following and following, falling on the side of persuasion here. So hopefully these will help you as you finish out your last speech. And if you have any questions, get a hold of me and we will see you on the flip side.